So now I have the pleasure and the honor to welcome every one of you uh, to the Copernicus lecture held by Luciano Floridi at this uh, Congress. Luciano, I may, I may tell it a little bit, because uh, he ironically is called by my students Big Luciano. Big Luciano is uh, Pavarotti, uh, or was to be uh, Pavarotti. It means that he is uh, for us a kind of uh, national glory, even if uh, he's now playing or better singing for the Queen. And uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, position, he's director of research and professor of philosophy and ethics uh, of information at the Oxford Internet Institute of the University of Oxford. He is, uh, as anybody know, best known for his work on the two areas of philosophical research, uh, the philosophy of information and the information ethics. Both fields of research he contributed to found and establish among the scientific community as anyone here can attest. In 2008, uh, Professor Floridi was awarded by the Gauss uh, uh, Professorship by the Göttingen Academy of Sciences. It is the first philosopher to obtain this honor. Between 2008 and 2013, he held uh, the research chair in philosophy of information and UNESCO chair in information and computer ethics at the University of Hertfordshire. He's currently Alan Turing Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. Due to my personal historical philosophical education, I always like to remember Luciano's first book, Skepticism and the Foundation of Epistemology, a study in the metallurgical fallacies published by Brill in 1996. But he definitely became more renowned uh, thanks to his later works, where he presents the result of his research on philosophy and ethic of information. Among them, I remember only the Cambridge Handbook of Information and Computer Ethics that he edited by Cambridge University Press in 2010, The Philosophy of Information, Oxford University Press uh, 2011, The Ethic of Information, Oxford University Press 2012, The On Life Manifesto, and The Fourth Revolution, How the Infosphere is Reshaping a Human Realty, Oxford University Press, both appeared in 2014. Thanks to this contribution to the reflection on the infosphere, Luciano Floridi is today the only philosopher sitting in the Ethic Advisory Board of Google, as well as the only philosopher who takes part to the Ethic Advisory Group of the European Commission. Currently, Luciano is Copernicus Visiting Professor at the University of Ferrara. As you might know, Copernicus graduated in canonic right in uh, 1503 at the University of Ferrara and was in the meantime doing his astronomical os observation, paving the way probably to the revolutions uh, Luciano lists in, in, his, in his books. And in this function, Luciano will held here the Copernicus lecture of this Congress with the title On the Human Dignity as a Foundation for the Right to Privacy. Please, Luciano, thank you very much for being here. Assuming that the microphone is working, assumption not justified, it is working, yes. Well, thank you uh, for the invitation, uh, uh, for embarrassing me uh, with all uh, that introduction. Uh, Matteo, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank uh, not only Matteo, but also uh, for the public, uh, but also Marcello and, uh, of course, uh, uh, Madam President uh, uh, Rosaria for uh, the kind uh, invitation to uh, held this particular lecture. Uh, it's been a, a great pleasure and a lot of work um, to be the Copernicus uh, professor. Uh, they uh, make you work hard here, uh, especially the students. So uh, a special thank for uh, the challenging questions that I've received in the past months uh, from the group that we uh, join uh, with Matteo uh, a few times. Now, a couple of premises before uh, we start doing some work here, especially for the, um, the best friends in the room, the ones who criticize you. This is work in progress. So, dear friends, Do not shoot, uh, because um, uh, I'm still uh, developing some of the ideas that I'm going to present today. Uh, I thought that uh, the opportunity was such that something new had to be provided. Some of you have heard me talking more than once, and I certainly did not want to give you another talk on the Fourth Revolution, although it will appear at some point, inevitably. 
uh, but something new uh, was uh, due, and I just didn't want to pass the opportunity of uh, presenting uh, new ideas that uh, uh, will probably uh, be improved uh, by good feedback. So that's uh, uh, the uh, premise. With all this uh, out of our way, um, do we need another talk on, uh, uh, on privacy? Uh, it's been a quite a uh, topic uh, in the last few years, so inevitably you must have heard a lot about it uh, here and there. The reason why this is um, um, the topic that I've chosen for this lecture is uh, partly got to do with uh, what Matteo has already uh, mentioned, uh, my role at the European level uh, in the ethics advisory group. Uh, our task is to advise the European Commission on the uh, ethical framework that should be adopted or could be adopted uh, in order to understand uh, data uh, protection. Now, for the non-European in the room, uh, you can relax. For the European in the room, uh, don't. Uh, as, as I will uh, explain uh, uh, presently, uh, the new regulation applies to the 500 million, plus or minus 60 from the British Islands, we'll see, uh, to whom this uh, regulation applies uh, straight away. Uh, the difference between a regulation and a directive is that, uh, in this case, there is no local interpretation and handling and a new rule according to the general framework. This comes from Brussels and gets applied straight away. Uh, so I will tell you more about the so-called GDPR in the course of the lecture, but that is the motivation behind. It is quite pragmatical, uh, and uh, so rest assured that any feedback here may actually get all the way to Brussels. So the damage could be immense. Uh, <laughs> so uh, premise, uh, why it is important to talk now of um, uh, the relationship between uh, privacy and uh, uh, human dignity? Well, because we are undergoing a bit of a, a foundational crisis. Um, we used to think of uh, human rights as nice pillars in the temple of Western society. They're all there, and actually interactions with the previous uh, UN Rapporteur for Human Rights, um, it was impossible to change his mind about this. Whenever human rights are in conflict, there is just an appearance Deep down, they are complementary, exactly like the column of this temple. They all contribute to you know, make sure that the stuff is up there. The truth is that uh, uh, this was uh, the case a long time ago, but it hasn't been for some time now, uh, say a decade or two. And for those of uh, us, especially some members uh, doing some debates in Brussels who thinks a foundational crisis about human rights. How is that possible? They have been around for centuries. Then uh, the former logician in me uh, can point to a foundational crisis in something that we had been doing for millennia, and yet we discovered there was something to be done about the foundations in mathematics much later on. So this is a, just a small analogy. Don't run with it. It's all there is. I've already said it. Nothing more than what I just indicated. But if the reasoning is, surely this is so important, we must have got it right at the right time, well, surely nada, no. Uh, there is a lot to be done in terms of foundations. Uh, why a foundational crisis here? Uh, why the human rights in general, as an answer to what kind of information society do we want to build? Oh, surely, no, that's the recipe, human rights, bingo. Um, why that sort of crisis? Well, partly because um, uh, the uh, space-time relationship that kept those human rights nicely in place without you know, fighting each other have disappeared. And they have disappeared because of the digital technologies. So today, uh, for anyone who has ever you know, uh, got anything to do with this debate, the so-called uh, Westphalian system whereby geography gives a hand to law and my place, my rule, your place, your rule, doesn't work anymore. So. It's like having a party with friends who thought they were always going to be good friends among themselves, but you never invited to your house. All of a sudden, they're in the same place and they hate each other. Uh, I will tell you a little bit more about this, but partly in the long run, uh, the problem that I want to address uh, in this talk and in the paper that will come, and finally in the book that you know, some way down the road is there, called Zero Imagination, The Politics of Information, of course, <laughs> after the philosophy and the ethics, that's volume three, uh, has got to do with solving the foundational crisis in our uh, human rights. Here is what has already happened. Security on the one hand, privacy and human dignity on the other, freedom of expression and information uh, at the other corner. Uh, all you have to remember is the right to be forgotten, uh, Google, and that's the 
tension between uh, freedom of expression and privacy, or Apple versus FBI and security versus privacy. And uh, just in case you want to have a predictive model of this foundational crisis, watch out, because the next right to be under fire is going to be self-determination. The day which hasn't happened yet, but we thought it had already happened with Google and the way the American ele elections are going, um, Hillary Clinton and how closely she is to uh, Eric Schmidt, the next round is going to be something horrible happening between a fourth box here, uh, namely self-determination, and then again, the digital influence, how that can actually shape, say, a referendum, for example, Brexit, today through, say, Facebook. So that is the kind of uh, environment in which we are uh, moving, and that's the background that I want to keep. Now, I know that is a bit of a binary logic here, yes, no, keep, do not keep, it's a matter of continuous, it's a matter of threshold, checks and balances on security and so on, but remember, the point that we had at the beginning was, if you read the, the UN declaration and any declaration that is derived from it, we have a one single line where all the human rights are at the same level. There is no texture, there is no architecture in the way we have been adopting human rights ever. It's not that one is higher than the other, one is better than another. They are all equal, they are all equal in the same equal way and they all come with the same absolute value, in theory. Certainly, we thought that that was the case in space. We never actually apply that in time. As you perfectly know, at a time of war, for example, you suspend some human rights, you don't suspend others. So inevitably, time is already making a difference in the architecture of human rights. It's no longer a bi-dimensional line. Some others are preferable than uh, some others, so say security as opposed to freedom of speech, where for example the press is immediately asked not to divulge, not to etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is a bit of uh, history to be done here, a little bit of learning, because the tension certainly in the uh, legal system has been there for a long while, but we're finally hitting uh, the fan as it were. Now that is the background, uh, and uh, I hope you will keep that in mind uh, for the rest of the talk, which is about how do we connect all this in a, no, 45 minutes analysis. So the big problem is, what information society do we want to build? Initial answer, human rights. Second problem, what human rights? That they come into conflict. Oh yes, so let's solve the conflict about human rights. What conflict? Well, we just saw that. Um, but is there a way of making these human rights a little bit hierarchical, a bit of a structure? Well, there's actually one case, the only case we know, where this is accepted generally by anyone who has actually subscribed to the UN declaration, which is a lot of people, no matter what they say when they're back home, um, and that is the preamble. The preamble introduces human dignity, which is not treated as a human right. It's treated as the foundation for any human right. It's kind of, in more logical terms, what justifies any assumption about human rights. So I want to exploit that to see whether we can provide a bit of texture, a bit of structure, to answer the question about the conflict, to answer the question about the human rights, to answer the question what kind of human uh, information society we want to build. So this has become uh, news 14 April 2016. That's the day when the European Parliament approved the General Data Protection Regulation, also known as GDPR. And as I said, no, uh, whoever is not a, a European shouldn't be worried. All the others, this is as big as the Euro, just to give you a sense is as influential and is going to be changing our lives as dramatically and significantly as anything else you can imagine, including Brexit. Because it's the regulation that Europe has adopted to do something with or nothing with your data. It's a big deal. Funny enough, in that context, human dignity appears only once in Article 88. And for your pleasure, here is the article. Um, blah, 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 shall include suitable and specific measures to safeguard the data subjects, that's me and you, human dignity, my italics, legitimate interests and fundamental rights, etc. I stop there because um, if someone, or oh, this has been in the making forever, has been in the making forever by very brilliant minds, this is not an undergraduate who writes 
human dignity, legitimate interests, fundamental rights, a lot of redundancy. No, 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 this is carefully crafted. That means that human rights, fundamental rights in the text, and legitimate interests are different from human dignity. You wouldn't put that line in that order if you didn't mean that A and B and C are distinct. Unfortunately, it happens only once. So the whole idea that we have in Europe that the castle of human rights is based on human dignity, especially privacy, shouldn't be having a bit of an extra role? Well, it does when it comes to interpretation. This is uh, the last long quotation I want to now uh, subject you to. This comes from the European Data Protection Supervisor, which is uh, the agency slash individual, uh, Giovanni uh, Butrelli, uh, and the entity that is part of the European Commission in Brussels, that is the final controller of uh, privacy, data protection, and so on. If you read through, and I, I won't uh, uh, bother you with the whole reading, but halfway through, privacy is an integral part of human dignity and the right to data protection was originally conceived, etc., as a way of compensating the potential for erosion of privacy and dignity through large scale, etc. So in the interpretation of the GDPR, all of a sudden human dignity is playing a key role. So how do we start squaring this little problem with the old domino effect all the way down to what do we do with the information society? Well, the way I explained this last time we were in uh, uh, Brussels with the uh, ethics advisory group, was the following. Human dignity is the eye through which you see human rights. It doesn't see itself. It's the lens through which you interpret the GDPR and through which you understand essentially what we do with human rights in Europe. So my uh, contribution to the debate uh, a couple of weeks ago was it should not have been mentioned even once. The mistake is not that it appears only once, it should appear more often. The mistake is to make it appear once, because all of a sudden you start wondering, if it appears once, it should appear more often, where in fact it's just the perspective through which you understand everything else. As I said, it's the eye that sees through, not the eye that sees itself. Now, in this particular view, we can uh, assume for the sake of the debate today, it's an assumption that is quite straightforward in Europe, but not uh, everywhere else necessarily, that the protection of privacy, and I'm talking about information of privacy, not the privacy you have in your house, uh, the protection of uh, privacy should be based directly, in a sort of first order, on the protection of human dignity. Imagine a tree and a branch, and you graft the, that particular branch straight to the trunk of that tree. Not indirectly, as a second order, through other rights. So there's the trunk, a branch, and another branch attached to that branch in that case, property or freedom of expression. So this means that instead of treating my data as my car, we treat my data as my body, my hand, my eyes, something that constitutes me to some extent, and therefore that I may or may not be able to sell. I can sell my hair, but I cannot sell my organs. Uh, and there's a reason for that, as opposed to my car, which is immediately subject to market forces, etc. Now that is the view that we um, certainly at the uh, group uh, in Brussels, and certainly at the European level in terms of legislation, are assuming as pretty much a de facto, a matter of fact, starting point. The question is not whether this is the starting point, because it is, is what does it all mean? How does he uh, pan out? Because you see that normally, when you start talking about privacy, and says, oh, it's all about um, human dignity, that's a lovely way of kicking you know, the can down the road, because we don't know what human dignity is in the first place. So uh, you are explaining something obscure with something even more obscure. Uh, if you didn't have a clue about human dignity uh, in the first place, that wouldn't help you uh, to say, oh, but this is not what we mean by informational privacy. So as usual, we push and push, and if you're a good philosopher, you don't let it go. No, that's the bone that you are not chewing. And you just push it further and say, okay, well then uh, we need to talk about human dignity, I'm afraid. Now this is something that we don't do in Europe uh, often enough, and that's what uh, the rest of the talk today is going to be about. So now you know why the title. Uh, can we have an understanding of human dignity 
such that it provides a foundation for informational privacy so that that informational privacy is understood in a constitutive sense, as we do in Europe, so that that becomes the ground for an architecture of human rights that is sufficient to deal with the challenging issues, the foundational crisis, which once resolved provides the framework for a proper construction of an information society worth of the 21st century. I hope the line now is clear. No, step by step, do, 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 we get all the way there. So now with the domino effect. Now let's start from the beginning and how we're going uh, all the way down. Unfortunately, <laughs> if you start digging, when people talk about uh, human dignity, what they really mean is exceptionalism. There's such thing as human dignity because we are exceptional. We're better, different, alternative ways of uh, living beings. We're not like dogs and we're not like companies. Companies do not have a dignity and depending on how you, you know, interact with Facebook, cats don't have a dignity, okay? Sorry, uh, I don't care. I can put the, you know, the, the, the pictures of my cat in any position whatsoever. No, hum no catty dignity has been infringed there. Not true for humans. So this exceptionalism, which is part of the history of human dignity in Western philosophy, needs to be analyzed once again, pushing back. How far do we need to kick this can before we regain the can all the way back to where we started? Well, finally, we reach the starting point, human exceptionalism. Well, this exceptionalism has quite a nice story, which can be summarized rather briefly, and the historians among us, please forgive me, because it's gonna be really, really sketchy. There are four ways of understanding human exceptionalism in hand, hand in hand with um, human dignity. One, call it ancient philosophy, and I no, promise broad strokes, it doesn't get any no, broader than that. Aristotle and Cicero are the two sort of uh, main uh, sort of, uh, culprits here. Human exceptionalism is grounded on humans' natural and unique ability of exercising virtuous control over oneself, passions, and the environment, animals. I put animals there because I'm kind. Uh, actually, the literature talks about slaves. Uh, it gets a little bit complicated because how you can have human dignity when you are you know, exercising control on other human beings. Uh, so let's put animals because uh, it's more in line with the you know, stoic animal uh, uh, drives to be uh, control. So it's about controlling uh, in a sort of virtuous way. That's why we're so exceptional. Move forward, and Thomas Aquinas here is the main reference. And human exceptionalism is now grounded on humanity's divine creation and existence in the image of likeness of God. Uh, forget about control, I mean, that's important, but the real ticket here is that you are created you know, like, image like God. That's why you're so special. And honestly, in the history of philosophy, we've never seen anything as big as this. Now, it, it can only get worse after that, as well. That is the ultimate you no know, bingo. Well, there was more coming up. Modernity, the Enlightenment, and above all, Kant. Human exceptionalism is grounded on humanity's rational autonomy and the ability of self-determination. That's what makes us so special. More special than anything else. And I said anything else for a reason in a few slides. And finally, there's a postmodern way, uh, which is a bit more vague, a bit foggy, I couldn't quite pin down anyone in particular, so any help, uh, please uh, come forward. But it's the vague idea that human exceptionalism is grounded on humanity's social recognition of each other's value. No, so it's so a mutual uh, ability of uh, you are valuable for me, I'm valuable for you sort of idea. And that's why we value each other as opposed to apparently spiders and cats. So these are the four pictures. But once you have these four, say, theory, to use a strong word, back to the problem. Remember that there's a connection between privacy and human dignity. We want to ground privacy on human dignity. So that if you do something wrong with privacy, you're doing something wrong to human dignity. Do you? Is it really so, according to one of the four theories? Well, I'm gonna skip uh, through. I hope it will be convincing, but there's more Q&A uh, waiting for us. But Take the antiquity, the Christianity, the postmodernity view, I'm skipping Kant, on uh, why we're so special. So special because da 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 da, 
this da 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 is human dignity, human dignity, privacy. I do something in privacy, I do something in human dignity, and I'm somehow mishandling this exceptionalism. I'm not. Breach of privacy does not affect human dignity in these three cases. Not really, not that much. Not in a way that makes you say, oh, no, no, you can't do this, because if you boom, 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 this particular point here is going to be affected. Say, uh, antiquity. Uh, control, virtuous control somehow um, um, about my patients and, and animals and so on. Well, you can breach my privacy. I'm still fine. There's nothing about that breach of privacy here that through the channel of if then gets to affect my human exceptionalism in any possible way, really. So that will not pay back in terms of defense of the first point. If I'm defending this because of that, but affecting this doesn't affect that, surely you know, the connection is a bit more loose. The only place where this happens is with the modernity Kant idea, autonomy. You can see that, well, that's complicated. I breach your privacy. Am I actually doing something to your special way of being human, namely your autonomous way of handling your life? Well, yeah, that's uh, possible. That's something that we can uh, start talking about. I have reservations for this reason. Because autonomy used to be something that only we had. In the round, nice, proper, I don't need to tell you because it's so obvious to everybody kind of sense. But depending on whether, you know, what we mean by autonomy, self-determination, self-regulation, in a sort of rule-changing learning, adaptability, smart tasking, well, there's a lot of autonomy out there that is not ours. So I'm not sure we can ground anymore so easily as Kant used to do human exceptionalism on autonomy because that doesn't qualify just us, not so simply, not so straightforwardly. So worst scenario is not doable. Best scenario, we need more to do all this building on that particular concept. And this is where Copernicus has to appear and the fourth revolution, inevitably. At some point, you can't miss it. Well, you know the three revolutions. I won't tell you because you heard me talking about this ad nauseum. But the fourth, the fourth revolution now self-understanding, the one brought about by uh, someone from Cambridge, uh, well, that is about smart agency, autonomous, shall we say intelligent, not so much, pretty stupid, but not pretty effective, task-oriented ability to have you know, no, self-learning, etc., interaction with the world. Uh, and once you start looking at us as information organisms, well, that special exceptionalism is, doesn't seem to be, at least to me, any more unproblematic. I'm open to debate here. And I think we have a way of taking this particular road, keep the Kantian foundation. But let's assume we want to pursue a different road. Well, after so many attempts for so many millennia to put ourselves at the center of anything, the universe, Copernicus, the kingdom of life, you know, biology, Darwin, mental life, Pascal, you, know, you bent, but you're still thinking, etc. Et uh, and then Freud. And the infosphere, I'm the only one who can park this car, I'm the only one who can fly that flight, I'm the only one who can buy these goods, and surely no one is going to beat me at chess or go or whatever, Turing. Well, isn't that time maybe to look for human exceptionalism? I remember you, this is the beginning of human dignity that leads to privacy, da da da. Isn't it perhaps the case of touching that particular point by saying, you know what, maybe, maybe it's not about being at the center of anything. Maybe we are at the outside, it's the periphery. It's beautiful to be you know, anthropo-eccentric. And maybe it's because I have a British passport now. But I mean, this eccentrism comes natural to us. So is that the only way you can do it? No, no, actually, there are roots. And it's worth studying a little bit of history of philosophy. If you read Pico de la Mirandola, Oration on the Dignity of Man, 1486, two things are immediately clear to anyone. First, how shitty philosophy was at the time. Because the complaint is abusive from him. Uh, he's you know, straightforward comparing colleagues to prostitutes, you know, selling themselves and everything else, which reminds me a lot of contemporary philosophy too. Uh, so that taken apart, the interesting side, which also caught uh, my eyes, is how malleable this special exceptionalism is based on. In other words, 
despite all the Christianity and all the mythology and all the blah blah and a lot of nonsense that you find in that oration, the real point here is that we are neither angels nor brutes, or we would say robots today, uh, according to Pico, because we are a work in progress. Oh, I like that. An open software, we would say today. Of course, that's not Pico, no. An unwritten text, but it's ready to be written. We're not at the top of the chain of being because we do not belong to it at all. So it's not being at the center or not at the center. We're just outside, and there's no room there. But this anthropo-eccentric view of our special exceptionalism being based on our utter openness, well, that is something that I think we can work on, and I need a word. I need a word that captures this openness of human exceptionalism. And look around, start searching. I think polytropos, or polytropos, is a good word. It's Greek, so that's always a, a good uh, thing for a philosopher. Um, uh, the poly speaks to anyone. It's the tropos that is important. Tropos is not just the place, but the ways in which you've been to place. And the beautiful thing is that it's the first line of the Odyssey is when Ulysses is described as a man of twists and turns. In other words, polytropon. Now, this Ulysses is open to the world is uh, really uh, sort of strict wise, we would say, but at the same time, incredibly flexible, constantly learning, but also guiding his own life in different ways. And uh, this kind of old cleverness and new openness, a combination between having seen the world but being ready to go further and see more, I think is what makes us exceptional in many smart and wandering ways. This is the kind of eccentric place in the universe that seems to me to clarify our dignity as a source of rights, but also our destiny as a source of duties, to be explained in a moment. If we, all the way back, remember the domino effect, privacy, human dignity, exceptionalism, what exceptionalism? anthropo-eccentric exceptionalism based on what a polytropon view, a kind of a Ulysses perspective, well, in this particular case, does it bite both ways? Because there would be, by one, get two. You get not just the rights, but also the duties. In what way? Well, in the traveler's way. Well, at the end of the day, that's what Ulysses is all about. You've got a traveler's ethics here because we are in the hands of our hosts. We have the right of protection and hospitality when we get somewhere. And that is the kind of expectation that we can exercise when it comes, for example, to our data. That's a long shot, eh? but remember the chain of uh, reasoning. At the same time, our dignity means to be master of our own journeys and keep our identities and our choices open. So, translated today, not being profiled. Because a profile mummifies who I am and tells me exactly that I have to be what I'm supposed to be and keep being what I'm supposed to be. If you are the reader, a reader of uh, Harry Potter, you better stay a reader of Harry Potter because I will recommend to you more Harry Potter. And possibly, ideally, you will never change your taste. And once read the first, you will read the second and the third and the fourth and the sixth and the seventh book of Harry Potter. And at the end of the day, you will not have read Plato. So, because I didn't. I read the first and the second and the third and the fourth, not being nicely nudged in that particular profile. But if you keep the road open, uh, in a sort of more Charles Sanders purse, application to self-identity, we're speaking about science, of course, well, this is something that we can cope with. So any technology and policy that manipulates such openness risks dehumanizing us. And there was a bit of a debate before the meeting uh, about how you pronounce that name in English. Uh, Silsis was the best I could do. Uh, if you remember the story, uh, which is not Game of Thrones, as I heard recently, but is about the Odyssey. Uh, so the friends and Ulysses, they get to the island and um, they never leave. They are identified uh, for what they are, animals, and Circe certainly does not like uh, that freedom. That's why we don't want to be Circe's guests. You don't want to receive those kind of gifts because we, they come with a price. So human dignity as polytropy as the ability of being in uh, uh, an openness uh, uh, aspect towards the uh, world in an anthropocentric, uh, modified into anthropo-eccentric uh, ground. 
That has a right to privacy, as individual control over our own constitutive information. That is the line of reasoning that, uh, believe it or not, we are developing in Brussels. Not in so many words, but that's the agenda, at least on my side. So most of ourselves uh, are narratives. I mean, we, uh, um, that's what we are. I mean, we are our own stories. And most of ourselves is written by other forces, um, culture, language, the day I was born, the place uh, you leave, your colleagues, and so on. There's a tiny bit that is hopefully in our hands. It's the protection of that tiny bit or that tiny part of openness and malleability that we want to make sure is protected when we talk about privacy as a matter of human rights and human rights as a matter of human dignity based on our exceptionalism. You destroy that and you have just created a profile of an individual that is repeatable, etc. So what the technologies have done to us, but we won't pursue this today, is that the digital technologies have, uh, of course, expanded the set of vulnerable and malleable individuals. Uh, think of uh, about the past. I mean, the number of people who could be vulnerable and malleable before having ICT was way smaller. Uh, today, you can easily uh, modify almost anyone out there, especially if you have uh, one billion plus people on uh, your database. But I said, does it buy both? Does it buy not just uh, rights, but also duties? Well, the duties of a guest, what are they? What can respect for the other? I mean, you join a house and you want to make sure that you don't make a mess. So the caring stewardship, which I discussed as well, and uh, I've discussed with some of you at length in other uh, context, turns out to be beautifully counterbalanced as a counterpart of the right to privacy. And as far as I know, that was something new that hadn't crossed my mind. I had never connected an ethics of care, say, for example, feminist ethics, medical ethics, environmental ethics, to a duty to respect privacy. But clearly, if you are a traveler, those two things start getting seen as two sides of the same coin. And within a philosophy of information, if human nature is constituted by your informational patterns, then nicely and coherently breaches of those patterns is bre uh, uh, means bre breaching uh, the very essence of who you are. It means transforming you into someone else that perhaps didn't want to be. That's where Kant starts becoming more an ally rather than an alternative. On privacy, and we're coming towards the end of the talk, there's something to be left in terms of, uh, so why are we so special? If we are special, not because we are at the center of anything, and we're not special because we are God's creatures, are we still special in any possible way? And I, I can hear immediately the naturalization of all this. Oh, we're not special. I mean, there's no difference between you and the usual gorilla, whatever that is, never met one, uh, though I met a lot of people acting like one, uh, and, uh, and your dog, um, no. Seriously, really? How many cats have you seen around having these kind of conferences? Get a grip, a real big grip on the fact that we are different. We don't have to be different because of religious reasons. We can be different in an anthropo-eccentric way in terms of a mistake. So finally, no, especially to the colleagues who are so inclined to naturalize, and I sympathize with the our instinct, our exceptionalism, a reminder that our exceptionalism doesn't have to be because we are cooler, better, more on top of anything. No, it's because we are outsiders. We shouldn't be here. We are glitching the system. The funny thing is that we survived, and that's why it's also kind of a beautiful glitch. But it is a glitch. So for the more Java-oriented people in the room, a non-fatal exception. That's what it is. That's what humanity looks to me here in this universe. A non-fatal exception. It did happen and survived accidentally. And in fact, survived so well that miraculously, quote unquote, is getting better at surviving so far. Because if we destroy this planet, well, this beautiful mind of ours won't have had any survival no, value whatsoever. No. So in that context, we are information organisms, and as such, our lives and identities are informational. That's what you would choose if the only alternative in front of you in a far future where we replace your body, you keep your mind, we replace your mind, we give you a new body. Mm, I want to see how many 
people go for new body, someone has mind, as opposed to, oh, I keep my mind, no matter what body you give me. I mean, it's like, it could be a, a can of, of tin, I don't care. If it is my mind, I'll keep it. I'll keep it any time. Because that will be me, my information, my uh, fears, my passions, the language I speak, the memories I have, the relationship I've always interacted or not, etc. That's me. My body, huh? of course, this dualism, this Cartesianism, plenty of discussion here. You sh we shouldn't be uh, entrapped by the small uh, analogy, but just to give a sense of uh, where we're going. And in that sense, the protection of privacy becomes the protection of personal identity, something that accidentally I had been arguing for uh, a decade before meeting uh, all these other people, thinking, oh, we want to protect uh, uh, privacy in terms of human dignity. Oh, wow, no, we join forces. We are on the same path here. It's not a matter of uh, philosophy of economy. It's a matter of philosophy of mind. It's about personal identity. It's not about personal property. That is where privacy cuts deep. If that is the case, well, then uh, zero privacy is like pinning down an open life onto the mounting board of a profile. And that is exactly this sort of butterfly uh, analogy I want to convey. You pick someone and you pin it down to that individual. You control it. In fact, you kill the exceptionalism in that individual. The ability to have a different life, to change, uh, to modify, to be, in a way, Kantian, the ally in control. So zero pri privacy, I'm sorry, Facebook, is dehumanizing. And anyone who doesn't agree with this, uh, it's probably not from Europe, because that is the view here. Uh, and I don't mean that is necessarily the right view, but it's the view that we are dealing with when it comes to the GDPR, not the uh, data protection uh, that we're going to uh, implement. And as such, privacy must be defended as part of human dignity, not as part of human property. With this, a conclusion, and I'm done. There's a bit of a problem. Because you always want, well, if, suppose for a moment, and I've seen so many skeptical faces, uh, I'm glad that you don't see all the other faces that I'm seeing. It's like, really? That's so unconvincing, complicated, suspicious. Like, okay, let's assume that for a moment, just for a moment, you're being nice. Come on, you can do it. Concede all this. There is a problem. What's the problem? That if everyone is around something, what is at the center? It's kind of a stalemate. If you play chess, there is an actual stalemate, by the way. Um, nobody moves. It's like two people at the restaurant. No, you first. No, no, you first. No, you first. And nobody gets in. And it's like, oh, come on, someone has to go. But, and allow me now, I'm trying to be light, but it's quite a, a white headian fundamental turn that we're taking here. What you can do, say, between wife and husband, oh, who is at the center? Nobody. The marriages. Little trick. You don't put a something, the relata, at the center. You put the relationship at the center, and everyone else contributes to that relationship. At that point, is friendship at the center, not the friends. Is politics capital P at the center, not that party, not the other party. Wouldn't that be beautiful? It's a bit utopian, but the stalemate doesn't really occur because something is at the center, is the relation, not the relata. So the anthropo-eccentric perspective that I'm trying to convince the European Commission to adopt uh, the damage we can do now, is such that you would put a relational philosophy, no, which has a bit of a taste of a process-like philosophy, that's the white head, another Cambridge man, um, in mind as a background. It's doable, uh, and hopefully after the Q&A, we'll see whether this makes any sense at all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate this talk very much. But and I can't hear. No, indeed, it doesn't. Try, try again. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yeah. then I can sit down. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I liked uh, all the talk very much. And uh, I like also this reference to the man as a traveler and the importance of his history. Because indeed, sometimes, when speaking with friends uh, who deny this exceptionalism, and by talking about, well, but men as a society, and oh yeah, also animals have societies in their ways. 
And then I thought about the fact that, okay, but we have history. We have the we history, uh, fashion, architecture, whatever. And also we conceive ourselves as a, I mean, we Juventus supporter, or, and animals don't do that. And so this comes also to the, uh, this relationship thing and with the ma marriage metaphor, which is very nice because indeed the uh, eccentrism comes also from the fact that the man puts the woman at the center and the woman puts the man at the center. Or in friendship, you put your friend at the center and vice versa. It was just a comment. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, thank you, Luciano, for this very interesting presentation. I didn't know ciao. <laughs> I didn't know that now you move to politics, which is very interesting for me. And <clears throat> I have a question. Um, I, I agree on uh, most of what you said. Um, I have a question about the um, possibility of um, supporting the diversity uh, of the human being. Uh, don't you think that this uh, informationalism turn was the problem, was part of the problem? Diversity of the human beings is based on the fact that it's not digital. Mm -hmm. So if you don't um, admit the fact that human beings are not digital, and, and digital technology is just one of the possible technologies that happen to, to be adopted, it's very difficult to say that we have to preserve something really different from in the human being. Because if we are, if we are like, let's say, a list of information, then the computer can be able to profile us. The fact is that we are not a list of information, unless the, the, the computationalism turn transform us into this list. No. Thank you. Um, so uh, I don't think that there was a question. There was a, a, a statement in the form of a question. Uh, it was a rhetorical question with which I partly agree. Um, partly because I, I do have uh, a metaphysics in mind where we are uh, interpretable as uh, informational entities. Um, I said information, I didn't say digital, and I'm very careful about making sure that uh, the informational nature of an individual is not mistaken for the digital profile that says something about my ID. Uh, I wouldn't dream about that. If you really struggle with that, uh, think of a, a Leibnizian monad. You know, if you really want to have something a bit more solid, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, so, but apart from that, uh, I don't think we should confuse uh, computational philosophy with informational philosophy, the digital with the informational. That is bad philosophy to begin with. Once you have that degree of confusion, anything can come out of that. But I'm not saying that we share that, com that confusion. I'm just saying let's stay away from it. The comment that I would like to make is um, even if, even if we make such a mess, it's too late. The digital has happened. We are on this train. We may not like the train, but we better decide where the train goes. Stopping the train from going, no, making sure that the train never happened, that the digital didn't occur, uh, that seems to me unrealistic. So I have, as I said, a, a twofold uh, position here. I don't think that that is the way forward to go. But even if you were, I wouldn't be uh, too optimistic about uh, reversing the wrong culture that we have now in terms of the digital interpretation of personal identity. I don't think that that's, I wouldn't support it, but insofar as it is so general and what is in the, say, in the newspapers, uh, I think we have to manage it uh, rather than eradicate it because uh, it might be too late. Uh, it's more like sort of managing uh, the environmental impact that we have had on the world. Um, saying that is bad doesn't solve it, although it is bad. Yeah. So, so I'd like to answer um, the human-centric, your human-centric criticism. I think this is a comment. I, I see the robot building as similar to the uh, Greek, um, ancient and Greek building of uh, pyramids. All the s social resources go into building pyramids. 
The pharaohs are the IPO oligarchs in the US and Silicon Valley. The priests are the builders of the robots. And there's no um, double blind experiments about the success of robots. There's um, forgetting the Light Hill criticism, uh, Cambridge professor. A and the result is a worldwide failing economy. So it's a comment. It's a comment, okay. Thank you. Um, yes, hello. Does anyone have a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. Well, I think one fundamental idea is that all humans are equal, but if you look at the data collection and the uh, big companies, that means it is very important to discriminate people. I'm not the same as you. I have maybe more or less money, and uh, they know how I move. Uh, and that means people are not the same. They have to discriminate more and more in the best sense of word. And on the other hand, my question is, I have been uh, some weeks ago at the Singularity University in Berlin, and the question is, isn't it sweet poison if we give up all our uh, data because they promise us uh, that uh, they will solve all problems of the world if we give up our privacy. So, can you repeat the question? Sorry. The question is, um, is uh, isn't it sweet poison if we give a up sweet poison? Sweet poison if we give up our privacy because uh, the singularity and also big companies promise that they then will solve all problems of the world, from energy to food resources, to uh, education, just uh, they need the data from us. So the negative at the beginning looks like you have a comment, really. That is a rhetorical question, isn't it? Okay, thank you. Next question. Yeah, I have uh, a, well, maybe it's a criticism, you tell me. Oh, please, um, please do, uh, okay, as long as it's not a comment, yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so <coughs> um, Odysseus was uh, a polythropon. Um, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, because he was the wily Odysseus, right? He was exceptionally clever. Um, he was able to work as, he wasn't the biggest, the strongest on the battlefield, he was just the smartest person in the area, right? So, <clears throat> I'm, I, here's my worry about your view. If we ground human dignity in this polytropos view, um, then it seems to suggest that the more clever of us enjoy greater degree of human dignity and those of us who have less, um, so maybe are less astute, um, we have less dignity. So is that an implication of your view? And if it's not, how would you block it? I, I, because I would endorse blocking that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, you know, I hadn't thought about that. Um, it's far from what I wanted to argue for. Um, uh, no, this is, a, uh, first of all, it's a bit of an analogy, so let's not take it too seriously. I mean, the, the, we're not, I wish we were, but we're not all Ulysses here. Um, but the second point, more seriously, is that if we get a sense of human dignity as based on the openness of the individual to uh, change, uh, a change according to different projects, for example, not autonomy, but no, a projectuality of the individual, uh, then uh, it doesn't matter whether it is big projectuality or small projectuality or, or big openness or tiny openness, it's openness anyway. So I would say, no, I, I don't think that there's any risk of saying, oh, the clever you are, the more, no, that, that's, that's a, uh, it would be very unfortunate if the message I sent were interpreted in that particular way. It would be a misunderstanding uh, of the message and I would not have conveyed what I wanted to convey. Um, it's pretty much what we all share, this idea that, well, there's a little bit of my life, uh, of each life, that is malleable, changeable, and is that little bit that needs to be protected, uh, no matter how small it is. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Luciano, thank you. I think that's a wonderful framework in which to, to work and think about these questions. I have a question about consent, uh, and, and in particular, the kind of choice that is uh, self-limiting. So you've discussed, and the framework that I understand here involves both uh, nation states and organizations like Facebook essentially limiting our choice by disclosing information or taking information in, in what we might call the private sphere. But there's a, uh, 
there's a concomitant um, self-limitation in that so many of us have a tendency to overshare on Facebook, for instance. And we, we do so under the, in, in plausible cases, uh, under conditions of consent. And consent is itself a kind of choice. It's a kind of choice that limits choice in, in the kind of case mm -hmm. I'm thinking of. So what, what will your framework have to say about consensual uh, ab abdications of one's own dignity? Thank you. That's brilliant. That paper, it's published, actually, uh, and it's called uh, Tolerant Paternalism. We need, to ex we need to find a way of exercising some paternalism at a level such that, which is not for today, because it will take us uh, another lecture, uh, it's not really another hour for discussion, but maybe later, a paternalism such that that paternalism is sufficiently tolerant to respect the freedom of the individual, but still intervening at such a degree that makes sure that the, the individual have a chance of doing the right thing. So in that sense, I'm against, in that particular paper, which you find online, uh, I'm against um, uh, privacy by design, for example, because I find it too paternalistic, but I'm in favor of an informational interpretation of that design by saying, before you do this, you have to decide on this particular point. Now, at that point, I'm not saying that no, we should respect the peculiar nature of the individual at any cost. I'm saying we should respect it by default to begin with. If then you and I want to make a mess of it, we should live in a society that allows us to make a mess of it. And that's the tolerant side of it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the equilibrium between uh, paternalism and, and, and toleration is rather subtle and not for now, but that's the direction, and that is a very, very good point. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I have uh, at least six questions. I guess they are the last. Uh, the people have uh, already raised their hand. It's uh, done, but uh, they have to be, please, very short in the questioning, and also I ask you I to should. be short in answer because we have to move forward to the symposium. Please. Thank you very much. That was um, very helpful. My question um, has to do with your interpretation of Kant's position. Um, from what I can see, Kant, I think, would actually be more supportive. You would, I think, could lend support to your position if understood in the following way, that by uh, how Kant grants, grounds human dignity is, is in not our humanity, but in our rationality. We're exceptions because we're rational beings, not just because... Um, and that's fine. Um, we can then, in fact, Kant recognizes that human beings are not the only kinds of rational beings, that robots or aliens or angels or gods or whatever could also be rational beings. So on your view then, um, sorry, um, but by rational he means, and by self-determination he means self-legislating, but by self-legislating he doesn't mean um, just making, doing what we want, but rather doing what the moral law tells us. So. Uh, we're self-legislating in that we can legislate the moral law. So there's a, a moral dimension to Kant's position. Is your position completely, um, is, is that moral dimension completely lacking, lacking from your position? Mm -hmm. yeah. I get the sense there's a moral dimension here. You want to be able in the end to say that say. disrupting, ignoring our privacy is, is not a good thing. So that, that is the bit in, uh, in progress. I think that uh, uh, Kant can be interpreted and used as an ally, as I said. Um, uh, I still find it uh, highly suspicious uh, when Kant starts talking about all that rationality and, and self-determination, the ability to individual. That sounds to me total science fiction. I like, really? Have you ever walked out of uh, Kennisburg, my dear? Because I don't see that rationality in the world. We're just going to vote for Brexit, as that's so you know, intelligent of us. So uh, all that rationality that is so much the Enlightenment sounds to me beautiful and totally unrealistic. Uh, well, you know, even economists, they don't believe in it anymore. We, we're the only you know, bunch in the world that still think that human beings are rational. Like, come on, get a grip again. Like, say, well, it's all rationality. So yes, beautiful. I, I wish you were that way. But no, next time you know, the same individual buys cigarettes and a lottery ticket in the same go at the same bar. That's the human rationality. Chances of dying of cancer, huge. Chances of winning the lottery, zero. And you're spending money on both. Like, that's the Kantian agent we're talking about. So, no. <laughs> I'm afraid that's a beautiful, beautiful philosophical project that has no traction in the real world. 
and I want to have something that does work in Brussels. So on that front, I love Kant, trust me. It would be great to have him as an ally, but I'm afraid I might be selling an Enlightenment project that it has no realistic opportunity to win the battle at the end of the day. Uh, your presentation was w wonderful, but I could see that it was very clearly European perspective. Since it is about something which will become a uh, rule in Europe, someone could say it's natural, why we should look for other perspectives. But if we want to make it first uh, respected by outsiders, th so 80-90% of humanity uh, outside of Europe, How I think, uh, I don't know, uh, oh, okay. outside Thanks. of Europe, probably 80-90% of humanity. 90%, we have half a, half a billion in Europe. Mm, so, let's say 20, okay. uh, 80%, 70%, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But Shall we, we not attach yeah. numbers to this, please? Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, this, uh, do you think is it a good idea not to refer to other traditions? Human dignity is clearly culturally loaded. It is. Thank you. I, I'd like to comment on that comment, actually, uh, because I think it's uh, wrong. Um, um, there are two ways of bringing people on board. One, by uh, lowering standards. The other one is by leading. And in this case, Europe leads. We can teach a lesson to the rest of the world. If they take it, fine. Otherwise, we can be tolerant. But there's no reason for lowering our standards. So if they take our view, fantastic. They don't take it, their life. But we should not compromise. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, uh, Luciano, thank you for your talk, and I really appreciate uh, the reference to the origin of modernity, to Picardella and Midarandella, which is, uh, I think, uh, uh, very helpful for, for today. My question is, is uh, concern your recommendation to the European Commission, because you say, okay, no privacy is no human right and no human dignity, and I perfectly agree with you, uh, with you but full pr privacy is really problematic. And you mentioned that there is uh, 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 some uh, balance between privacy and security and transparency. And I think it, it was clear you. in, in your slide. And so the problem nowadays with the European Commission is that they want to have full privacy. For instance, uh, you remember that th th there is the idea that uh, uh, personal uh, information should be erased except if it is of historical interest. But we don't know in advance what is the historical interest. So, what... what for Scientific or statistical. Yeah. Things, yeah. yeah. But uh, oh, could, you, could you say what, what was your recommendation for the European Commission in this respect? And uh, 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 do you know if they agree to follow some of your recommendations. So I think that there's uh, a lot of openness in terms of uh, uh, understanding, and so recommendations come from all corners, and they're all decently welcome. Um, the, the one that I'm making at the moment, but it's working process again, is to try to use the variable of time as opposed to the variable space, so that if we have to put some uh, hierarchical structure in human rights, that comes with a, a time lag, saying, at this time, this right is preferable to that right because of the circumstances, as opposed to in this place, in that place. So when it comes to security, for example, there might be circumstances where security so, is more important than privacy. But the circumstances doesn't mean no, a particular no, place. It means at a particular time. If we switch, in other words, Westphalia from topology to chronology, I think we have a way forward. But trust me, it's really work in progress, and I'm so much in the dark, and any help is really welcome. And you know, uh, I would say otherwise if I could. Yeah. <laughs> Let me come back to your beautiful framework when you actually recognize the conflict among different moral reasons and moral duties. What would you think of adding also something that may be called moral propinquity? Maybe, you know, the example of family, which for members takes some level of priority over the others. Isn't this the other part of the framework that helps us even justify your response about European values moments ago, as well as maybe some framework for immigration and other really important yeah. philosophical good, good issues? Good point. Very, very good point. Thank you. Uh, 
so this is something that we are working on. Uh, I've been uh, sort of pushing for this particular point, which is treating privacy not just an, as an individual right, but also as a group right. And when it comes to groups, you start immediately hitting into a completely different literature, uh, which has been around there, you know, in terms of do groups have rights? Do have their rights in terms of their rights or its right? I hope you see immediately the difference. Has a right as a group or because all the members of that group have a right which therefore provides the right overall. And uh, if you want to know at the moment, but then again, work in progress, please, uh, suggestions are welcome. I'm pushing for its right. I'm saying, look, we should really consider the possibility of having privacy as a group's right as a group. So a whole ethnicity, for example, will have a certain right uh, of privacy as ethnicity, not because of you and me and so on. So that's the idea. Yeah. But thanks, that's a very important point. Well, there are two questions. Please, as concise as possible. Uh, I, I find the general shape of your presentation intoxicating. But as a formalist far exceeding the metrics that you applied to Kant in order to dispense with him, um, I have to ask you whether you're prepared to abandon this, this, this project. And the reason I ask that, let me contextualize that a little bit. You are capable of remarkable rigor in philosophy, as we all know. You said this was preliminary, and it is. But clearly the punchline is the notion that our informational natures are impacted by invasions of privacy, certainly zero privacy. Mm -hmm. Are you sure that that's actually going to be, in the end, sufficiently, perhaps consistent, but are you sure it's going to be sufficiently rigorous mm -hmm. to handle the burden you want to place upon it? Our informational natures, at least according to some construals, are rather large, and this relates to Jean Gabriel's point, I think. I know that your eyesight's not 2020. I know that you prefer gray, conservative, charcoal gray suits. I, I think there's even a pattern of blue in the shirts that you wear. I think I have some general notion of the attributes that maybe are even in your mind, but that's not an invasion of privacy, right? So again, my question is in light of this, are you prepared to abandon it or do you just commit to it and go with it no matter what? No, thanks. Uh, no, this goes back to a completely different topic, which is what it means to describe an individual as uh, an informational organism. And uh, there, for the sake of uh, brevity, I can only uh, provide an analogy. In the same way as you know, something is not constitutive of me in my body, not my nails, no, which they grow and I cut, not my hair, which they grow and I cut, and I'm still me and I don't care. In fact, I'm changing a lot of cells anyway and it's still me. Likewise, my informational uh, identity is not generated by the shade of blue on my shirt, uh, and certainly not by, say, the name I, I bear, which is totally accidental. But there's a constitutive group there, a kernel of information which I know it's me. And if you take that away from me, that will be a different me. Now, it's fuzzy, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. So the difficulty in terms of rigorous analysis is there, and I admit it immediately. But it's the, the difficulty in saying, well, is it the same kernel for, say, Alice and Bob? Or you know, do we talk about something absolutely untouchable? Or, for example, my sexual orientations are kind of for me but not for someone else. That is an open question which I don't have an answer to. But the question that I have an answer to is surely not everything about me is you know, constitutive of me, not in any possible way. So I'm happy to be way more subtle and flexible in terms of how much, what, exactly when, and so forth but I will still pursue the idea that that's what constitutes me as me. It's pretty much the idea, you know, the fancy sort of, uh, sci-fi idea that you sort of transport your mind somewhere else. If your mind is that informational blob, well, that's what it's you. Uh, so I, at some point, I think I'm making a very trivial point, to be honest. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk. I have also a bit of a critical query regarding the f development of your theoretical line here in this thought. You started off by saying that whilst you're not sure whether K 
Kant and modernism might be relevant, you were sure that antiquity and Christianity don't really create that link between violation of, um, of privacy and violation of dignity. But you use an awful lot of antiquity uh, in your argument and an uh, um, awful lot of um, um, exceptionalist arguments which have a bit of a, a Quinian ring in my ear. So I do wonder, is there the potential of an inherent contradiction in your theory? Oh, I fall until there's a potential contradiction in you. Can you tell me where the contradiction is? No, I, I really didn't grasp the last point, please. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I got the point. Um, so, it's the difference between uh, talking about a particular philosophical theory, which I find unsatisfactory, and a culture which I find particularly no, uh, enlightening. Uh, so you can find a culture that is enlightening, for example, whatever is culturally behind the myth of o Odysseus, and use it, reinterpret it, for different purposes. That has got nothing to do with criticizing Aristotle, does it? So you can like Odysseus and Homer, and dislike Aristotle at the same time, and that's perfectly consistent. So what I'm saying here is, if you're looking around, you don't, we don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. I'm not here to say, well, as this has never been thought before, and there are no examples, and we cannot even find a... Now, that is particular background, it's going to be Odysseus, for someone else it could be Gilmar Gesh uh, or any other sort of uh, mythical uh, view. It's got nothing to do with the philosophical criticism of a philosophical theory that comes from that culture. So I hope that the distinction helps, at least in clarifying, in not, not dissipating your doubts, at least clarifying where the doubts should be, as opposed to where they are at the moment. 